thanks for um, agreeing to be a featured speaker at the symposium this year. It was really, really something else. And I got to tell you, as I walked out of the room, I turned around and checked out the crowd. And, and turned into salt. And there was this, <laughs> there was this look of um, excitement and panic and uh, it, blown away. Yeah, every, everything in <laughs> yeah. between because you painted such an interesting sort of perspective on I won't call it citizen journalism, but it, you know, under the current, there was this notion yeah. of um, you know the user as the center of this whole new web web yeah. world, and yeah. uh, I I just think it was a, it was the right message to sort of start the afternoon with, and I, I want to thank you for coming and doing that. Well, good. I, I thought you were going to say people were afraid because you were leaving and they wanted you to oh, come no, back. Oh no, 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 no. We're we're behind the scene guys here, as right. you can tell. Yeah, because. Right. But again, you know. Where do you think all this is headed? The thing that I think was most interesting, one of the things was the whole mobile technologies thing that you touched on and how it accelerates the ability to contribute, change, and alter some of the things that are going on in this Web 2.0 space. Yeah, um, it does. Um, I'd say that there are a few things going on. I'm trying to find a few of my phones. Um, <laughs> here, let me get this one. Um, uh, one, there's a whole bunch of angles. One is the privacy angle. And this is one that came up a few times. I had a slide, I don't know if you saw it today. It was problems with Web 2.0, and I skipped it because mm -hmm. we don't have time. Um, the privacy angle is really, really interesting. Um, we don't really have a good sense of privacy anymore. Um, our, were you part of the conversation last night? We were talking yep. about this. We, we had the. This is before we started talking about balance chart galactica. That's when the conversation really improved, I think. But, yeah. um, but our sense of privacy, we worry about students on, on MySpace or on, on Facebook disclosing too much. And I, I think in many ways the the Teenagers have a much better idea of privacy than adults do. Um, I mean, we talk as if there is such a thing as privacy. Mm. Um, I mean, the, the CEO of Oracle said privacy is dead. Get over it in public in 2000. Right. Um, I mean, we think about things like I, I have a I have a rant which well you remember this it was in the end of my, my talk at uh, Sigux. You ask people yeah. how many how many uh, adults protest their grocery store for targeting purchases based on their card right. and on their um, and coupons printed according to your purchases. If I know your grocery purchasing for a year, I know a lot about That's you. That's right. And so stuff that you probably wouldn't want me to know. No. Um, Which is why I advocate exchanging those cards between people. We'll use them once and then change and them the up. That's the first time I've heard anybody say that. I, mean, I, I do know a few people yeah. who only buy cash. Uh, yeah. I mean, they're like yeah. cranks, like survivalists, you know, the majority of mm -hmm. them. I mean, do you protest uh, surveillance cameras? No. Nobody does. They don't prevent crime, they move it around. No, it's interesting, but where I shop, there is a camera at the end of each aisle. And, and oh. I'm assuming they're telling us that the, the camera's there in case anybody tries to reach into the till. But you, you have to imagine that... Wait, so it, not the end of each merchandise aisle, but each uh, checkout? At the en end of each uh, checkout area. So, so they potentially could have my picture, mm -hmm. they know my profile from my shopping card, yeah. and they have my credit card information. Yeah. Now they have my... You know, and money. presumably your PIN number because they got right. the camera right. dialed right in on the keypad. Yeah. So let me know when there's a march against that. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, go to Amazon. I mean, my casual browsing informs their business model. Yeah. Uh, Netflix. I mean, over and over again, we're, we are hoping I mean, our privacy is a, uh, a thing of the past. I mean, I, I was telling somebody before, these things, see, that's all web based. That's not very mobile, really. In many mm -hmm. ways, or it's, that's intranet based. Um, I mean, if, I, if uh, Ryan and I are worried about you, one of the things that we could do is like, I could take my phone, give him a call, put my phone under your office desk or under your car seat, and then you know, we'll go to Ryan's and we'll just listen because we've had a little bug planted on you, <laughs> you know, for free. And this started showing up in the British press in 2001. I mean, in the British press, of course, it was always a sex scandal, which is a different thing, but, um, right. but it works that way too. I mean, and these are, this is nothing in yeah. terms of world phones. You know, this little guy, this little camera, I remember sure that Huygens yep. probe? The Cassini probe that it came from has a camera that is this powerful. And this is unremarkable. You know, if I go to Kenya, I'll get a better phone for less money. Um, and we, we haven't begun to worry about this. Have you seen any of the YouTube videos that are shot by students in classrooms, yep. other teachers? Yep. Yeah. Start freaking out and uh, mm -hmm. throwing things and breaking oh, things. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. Yep. I mean, we haven't, we haven't begun to think about this. So now you look at our data at Penn State. Now, what was interesting is, is Lee this morning shared some numbers about, you know, MP3 ownership and device mm -hmm. ownership mm -hmm. and phone. And we were higher consistently on all of those things here at Penn State. So um, MP3 is ownership is 80% on our campus. What do you example. think that is? Uh, maybe just the targeted demographic. Um, but what, what about yeah. that, do you think? I mean, uh, do, you have, do you have a, a high proportion, for example, of science majors and, and 
people interested in the field so that might happen? I mean, no, I don't, no, I don't, think, I so. don't I think, think so. I, I mean, we are known for our engineering programs, but I, yeah. I, I think it's across the board. If you break it down by yeah. discipline, it's across the board. Yeah, and no, I think if you look at the 18 to 22 year old demographic and cell phone usage, we just got our data back and it's at 93%. You know, a lot of people assume it's at 100%, but 93% ownership of mobile devices, mo mobile phone devices on our campus. Is that undergrad or undergrad and grad? That was, I think, a representative sample of all students, so that would be undergrad, yeah, undergrad, undergrad and graduate. Undergrad. But, you know, our undergraduate population is 80,000. Yeah, okay. so I'm just, just thinking of, of different ways that people would not have a cell phone. Yeah. Um, and, and who that could be. And a grad student, of course, could be. I know, I was talking to your dean this morning, and a lot of the undergrads are traditional age, so they're more likely to have cell phones. Mm -hmm. But the older you get, the less likely you are for different reasons. Um, no, I mean, I'm not surprised that penetration now, how many campuses are equipped to push content out to cell phones? Almost none. That's it. And, and, and that, that's mm -hmm. sort of the question is then I'm standing in front of a class lecturing and how do I tap into this great device that these kids yeah. are sitting in my classroom yeah. really dying to use? Well, have have you used a clicker? Yeah, we have yeah. We've clicker Clickers investigations. Are and, and but you know what's crazy? We ask students about would they use their cell phone as a, as a clicker and they yeah. say yes and then they say, wait a second, I have to pay for that, for that right. text message. And they get, but then you add up the cost of a text message, or not a text message, but you know, the, the clicker response, and it ends up being cheaper over a semester than it would cost you to buy the, the clicker itself. The real cost is at your end, the infrastructure end, That's right. figuring that. Mm -hmm. And that may not be possible for some phones because they're, they're, they're so walled off. Right. So, I mean, I've talked to a few colleges where they're looking into that and it became prohibitive. Now, those are often smaller colleges. You guys might have. Well, we, uh, we did do an investigation here of, of actually that very question. You know, could our automated call recognition stuff handle yeah. that? Could the, could the back end handle that? Could we plug into the VoIP infrastructure that yeah. we're developing? And it did, the costs were prohibitive in terms of making sure that we know that this is Professor so-and-so's section in this particular room that's voting on this particular right. question. And, and that, it, it, the costs started to become prohibitive. So then you so. get $10 PRSs and it's a lot easier. Right. But then you have to start to wonder about things like Twitter. And I know that, you know, that's, like, it was great in your talk. You said that somebody said something along the lines of, I miss the old days of Twitter, you know, six weeks ago. Yeah. And I think a lot of us feel that way because it's slow and all. But there's a perfect way of using, like you were saying today, Web 2.0 makes this stuff cheaper yeah. and easier. And the ability to make it happen is literally at your fingertips. Now with your cell phone, you don't have to develop, potentially, this massive infrastructure to support right. a Twitter stream right. of students who are all friends to this one class. Mm -hmm. Let's call it, you know, Instructional Systems 451 is the Twitter account well, and all the students are friends. And Why right. should I use my computer to, to Flickr? I mean, I should be able to phone in my images. Right. Well, you can. There is the architecture for that now. Mm -hmm. It's a pain for most phones. And mm -hmm. a lot of Americans deliberately don't buy photo phones or they don't have a good internet connection from that. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's, that, that's lame. I mean, it would save time. Or you think about, um, do you know digital storytelling? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. we had a summit meeting with the, the Berkeley group in uh, August of last year. It was really interesting. And the Brits who were attending the meeting attacked the Berkeley guys by saying, why are you still teaching Final Cut? This is a waste of time. Huh. Get a cell phone, right? And this is easier. You can capture mm -hmm. the stuff. It's good enough for what you're doing. And then let's look at editing from that. So you can just save time and money. And the Berkeley were like, cell phones too big? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating. I mean, right. But they were really surprised mm -hmm. because that's just not part of their life at all. Um, mm -hmm. It's not part of their experience, and they're so comfortable with it. I mean, that's that that division is, is stark, um, and I, I think it's going to take a while before we get past it. And it might be a, a deep-seated division, like uh, the power outlets between the U.S. and Europe. Yeah. Well, I think part of it is is the way that uh, li li lined calls were land. You know, your typical POTS phone were were metered in Britain and most of Europe, where it's very you know per minute type. Oh, sure, calls sure. and then the so the adoption of mobile technology happened a lot quicker there yeah. because you could get around that. It was cheaper. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's true. A lot of there, there are a lot of reasons there are books on this now. It's a big deal, you know. And right. Courses on this, and one of the reasons the cost I mean, for British Telecom, for example, is much cheaper to use an SMS or to, or to call. Right. Um, and for other inter if you look at Eastern Europe or uh, if you look at North Africa, it, landlines are still in their infancy or bad. And it was just cheaper. We just roll out a, a cell phone network and go past that. Right. And you see a lot of that in Africa. You see a lot of that in Asia. In the U.S., you know, our landlines are good enough. Mm. Uh, there's a similar reason that has to do with uh, laptops. I didn't see many in my talk today. I was surprised. I was surprised um, 
in Lee's talk this morning, there were a lot more people with their laptops out and actively running. What's that? I think I it was because of lunch. The, yeah. the tables were crowded. Because yeah. they won't put chicken on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. presumably. <laughs> but we have so many more laptops and desktops, and so much more access to it, that uh, for a lot of countries where adoption of cell phones became an issue, that was an alternative to that. So mm -hmm. if you're in Japan, in Japan, a lot, of a lot of families would have one computer for the family. It'd be a family computer. And you wouldn't want to open your MySpace on that, you know, mm -hmm. or, or share your photos. Uh, or an instant message when somebody else like your parents could find it, so you can self it on the stem. Whereas in the US, we have you know, a pretty decent amount of hardware available in schools, pretty decent amount of hardware available in libraries, and of course, individual family ownership is pretty high. Uh, so a lot of cell phone users can do that way. Uh, there's also people who call this the size argument. I'm, I don't buy it. I think it's, I don't think it's true. But the US is too big. It's easy to roll the cell phone coverage plan for Holland, but for half of North America, you know, it's hard. I don't think it's a size problem. I think it's the architecture. Yeah. Russia, right. China have much better cell phone mm -hmm. coverage, which are comparable sizes. Um, in Vermont, well, as, as you found out when you were there, was it three years ago now? Yeah, just about. Uh, Vermont actually banned cell phone towers about five, six years ago. So we have coverage remaining half the state. In fact, upstate New York, I'm not sure about the policy ways, but there were fewer cell phone towers along the Adirondacks. And during um, this winter, a man died arguing because he didn't have cell phone coverage. Had an accident, was back and hurt, called cell phone, no coverage, died an explosion. So there was a big push to add more towers. And this is our mm -hmm. on that sort of beautiful lots of and spoiled that the way that happened, mm -hmm. you know, with towers. And it's it's odd that these are the kind of questions that were up eight, ten years ago. Um, mm -hmm. and so uh, someone at the end of the talk asked, am I optimistic? I mean for why is mobile technology I hate to say it, but one thing that I'm just talking about is uh, the Apple phone. I, I'm, I'm not an Apple evangelist. I'm, I'm really nervous about the iPhone. Uh, what Steve Jobs celebrated, uh, the patenting of it, and the Apple heard said, yeah, I thought, oh, great, yeah. another software patent. And in fact, one thing that really worries me is that arguably the patent that he had wasn't for the phone, the argument was for a screen. If he's patenting touchscreen, it's just not what we need for other devices, right? But, the app, if the Apple iPhone can tap into the iPod cult status, it might push American phones to be better as competitors come out. I mean, I, I have an MP3 player, it's not an iPod, it's really cheap, it works great. And the reason is because there's all this competition and people are following the mm -hmm. So maybe we'll see more of that in a couple of years. That's one, one thing I brought so, But we need to have a conversation of privacy and a better one. And I, I don't see that in the horizon. I mean, I'm increasingly starting from the assumption. Do you know David Brin's book, The Transparent Society? Mm -mm. No. That's a science fiction writer. Uh, he argued that, 1998, yeah. <laughs> that there can be so many video cameras that, video cameras, imagine, back when they, people thought about that, <laughs> um, that there would be no more privacy, that you could video to anybody. And maybe this doesn't come true. He said, well, let's just assume subtle transparency. Not, not in a good way, but just assume that everything you do can be surveyed. Well, it's increasingly, you know, more and more that is true. Well, then how do we think of privacy? Do we accept people's foibles? You know, I, I, that's a social revolution. I mean, I mean I, I've had students who wonder, should they talk about their sexuality on their blog? And I'm, well, you know, we live in a pretty open, progressive society. Or if they get a job in rural Florida, yep. you know, pick a place. Um, that, I mean, the privacy argument is one that we're going to be trash for a while. Well, do you think, I mean, we just, we just, Asked students this question: How many of you are using privacy features in Facebook? Mm -hmm. And we saw that about 70% of our students are. So we've jumped from literally probably 12 months ago with people not not getting privacy, students especially not getting privacy, to now almost three quarters of them saying, you know, I'm going to make some of my stuff a little harder for you to find. Yeah, I'm, I'm not at all surprised. I think um, I think students have been thinking about this more than we give them credit for. Mm -hmm. And if they would publish stuff to LiveJournal or Zanga or Facebook or MySpace without it, I think in part they're counting on people not following. And that seems naive, except it's not always naive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I look at someone's LiveJournal publication that's open, I think, well, I could follow that. That's not hard. Not every parent does that. Right. Every parent could. But now increasingly mm -hmm. parents are, so now it's happening time. So. We certainly had an incident here, which I think turned the tide a little bit. We had a, uh, a huge football victory over Ohio State. Uh, the crowd rushed the field, 
And a, as usual, it was like, well, we got to get these guys off the field. Some people were arrested. And what, what they did was that they took pictures of the people coming onto the field. With their cell phones. And, taking pictures of their cell phones. And people posted it to a Facebook group, say, I rushed the, the, the uh, Penn State field after the Ohio State game. And w it was actually used to identify people who did that. I mean, it was, it was sort of an admission of guilt. And I think some of the coverage of that particular story turned the tide a little bit in terms of, you know, getting them to think about privacy, getting the typical student to think about that. It's, it's quite an issue. Uh, I remember hearing about this case, and there are a few other ones too. Which school was it where the football team asked its students not to use Facebook or MySpace because they were afraid of people posting things like that, but worse <laughs> or, or more dangerous? Um, at the same time, I, I, I hope you contribute to the open web. Did you see my, the last slide I put up, the one with the division? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I think in many ways we celebrate that. I mean, if we're going to put content on iTunes, it's there by lot. Put something in Angel on the website to your web. It's behind lock and key. I'm worried about copyright. You got to keep it behind so the DMCA. Uh, excuse me, so the uh, key jack can cover it. Um, I really worry that we're we're growing this uh, shadow universe. Um, and one of the reasons why media don't cover live journal. One reason is because a lot of the authors are women, um, and there's the media story that blogs are written by men. It's hard to get away from that. But also, live journal was one of the first to pioneer blocking blocking out pages, mm -hmm. so only friends could see them. And that doesn't show up in Google, and that's hard for a casual reporter to see, uh, so you don't see as much. Um, I, I like this. I like. To, I hope that we participate in the open web as much as possible. I mean, one of the things that frustrates about me about Wikipedia discussions are they're more or less, how dangerous is the Wikipedia? Should I ban it totally or only part of the time? I mean, well, why not just say all of higher education should jump on the Wikipedia and make it better, edit it upwards? It's not hard, you yep. know. I mean, right. and, and think about. You know, we have, I mean, how, how big is the faculty of the, of the Penn State system? 5,000. 5,000. Right. So imagine how many faculty are in the United States. They're all credentialed. They've all gone through this process, right? Well, have them just, you know, take five minutes a year. Wouldn't that improve the Wikipedia? I mean, that's the kind of discussion you should be having. I, I, I think academia is still uh, not nowhere near that. Well, I, I love the point of, you know, the, the sort of notion that, we're building this shadow web, if you will, behind, you know, in the, in the walled garden. But there's a couple things here. You know, we work with faculty, and they tell us, hey, I'll open my stuff up, but then when it comes, push comes to shove, they don't, right? But the other side of this is the student content. Right. And what we're seeing is we're getting ready to roll out a university-wide blogging platform, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, we're probably a month away from this thing, where every faculty, staff, right. and student has a personal what, website. What uh, movable type. Excellent. We'll type when we've made it work with our authentication. And so are you, are you, yeah. are you talking with the uh, Minnesota guys who did this? Yeah, yeah, okay. we talked mm -hmm. with Uber on the CIC as the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. big tent. Yeah, so yeah, we, we meet with these guys. But oh, great, break but, a leg. But here, this is what's great about it is that students can do this, mm -hmm. and we see it as on a continuum of e portfolio. It's light on this side, and then there's, you know, for blogging, you can do some basic things. Mm -hmm. And then, there, you know, there's heavy end e portfolio. But yeah. can we get kids to come out of these other spaces? And that's the big question that, that I think we're wrestling with is so many of them are already in the Facebook, right? They already have their MySpace pages. They already are, are contributing in all these other places that they really own. Oh, yeah. you, see, you see what I'm saying? And then well, how do we draw them out and pull them into this, sure. this architecture that we're providing? There are a whole bunch of different ways. Um, and one angle, I'm so glad to hear this, is that it's got to be conscious. I mean, one thing that I keep running into is um, as an educator, small college constituent group meeting, there was a big discussion about colleges that have the black web, black web FCP, thinking about Moodle. And there are all these great conversations, yeah, we really good conversations about the architecture, staffing, was really good. Mm -hmm. And then someone asked, well, how many of you made a decision to do that or not to do it based on pedagogical needs? One hand went up like 100 schools. Do uh, faculty know this? Do students know this? I mean, we're using, we're using Blackboard. Are you using it for pedagogical reasons? It's an interesting question, right? So, so if you're going to do this open conversation or a closed conversation or something in between, I mean, like, uh, I don't know if you've seen this feature you can do with uh, Flickr. I'm sure you've seen this. Yeah. Where you can have some images visible to friends. And uh, my, I, I posted a blog post about that about a month ago where I took my pictures from public into, for my friends, and then I moved in friends and family, and then I invited people because my wife and I got a little nervous about people looking at pictures of our five-year-old daughter. And exactly. 
And mm -hmm. I can't tell you, it was the most traffic post on my blog in two years. This wow. this open conversation about should I go public or private. In so open conversation. In an open conversation. And mm -hmm. I got advice from literally dozens and dozens of people on what to do. And so stories about other people that have done this. It's a hot button issue. And it is. And you know what it is? It's, it's about you, you make this decision to live a transparent life. And then all of a sudden you take a step back from it and you say, is this the best thing? And do my kids have a yeah. say? Am I imposing this right. on my children? Am I saying to I, my five-year-old, hey, just because I'm out there, you you, you got to be out there too. So and what is the legal basis of for you and your five-year-old parent? And then well, that's you right. have you as a teacher in the classroom, you know, what is your legal basis of students who have, some who may be minors, some who are adults, and then you ask. I mean, then then make an informed decision based, I mean, there is the, the privacy of your, your five-year-old, and it's obviously bad. Mm -hmm. so I should ask a ninja, right? Yeah. <laughs> we were watching one in, in staff, and someone took the ninja, they, they, they cut off his head and put on one of our staff heads on it. <laughs> so, do you want that? Maybe that's offensive. Right? Yeah. You know, but, but then there's also the pedagogical thing of will my need here for this one class, will this be enhanced by a global, potentially, conversation or, or harm? I, I, I don't think most people ask that question. And I think that's the kind of question that we really have to talk about. Because that is an architectural decision, a legal decision, a copyright decision. Right. But also, is it, I mean, and it's not predictable. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I had a conversation with two professors at the um, University of Puget Sound and then at Whitman. Uh, one was a history professor doing 17th century history. They're keen to make sure that that doesn't get out to the world. Hmm. I'm thinking, wow, I mean, 17th century is pretty cool, but man, I didn't think it was that risky, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then there was, uh, the other one was teaching sexuality. It wanted students to blog about their sex yeah. lives Openly. to the world. Yeah. And I think, I, I would expect it the opposite. You know, it, it's not predictable. Right. But don't you think that's where the conversation, at least in my mind, is starting to swing to? It's starting to, we're sort of through talking about these technologies for technology's sake, and now it seems like people are starting to start to think about these other things. How do we apply them? I think there's a lot I think you're ahead of most schools. Well, I don't, I, I mean, I'm watching the, the blogosphere that I that I hang out in, and it's the edgy blog space, so you know, you're in my RSS feed, and, and you know, and, and Stephen, and, and Darcy, and all these other people, and I'm sort of seeing the same theme emerge from a lot of people, where people are taking a step back and sort of reevaluating how we participate in this thing, and looking at how do we be more responsible, but at the same time share, and it, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting that it's almost becoming, and I'm not all about O'Reilly and his, you know, code of conduct and all those things, but there has to be something there that, that's emerging. Well, this, this, this is where the Kathy Sierra case is really yep. nuts, because in part, did you see the CNN story? No, I didn't. It was horrible. They, they used the word Q to describe Kathy Sierra at least oh, that's three great. times. Yeah. They had a little mm -hmm. action photo of the, the news picture, like closing on her head. It wasn't the thing. It was just this is CNN. I mean, yeah. even though I hate them, like I said, well, this is the leading news agency for TV news in America, possibly in the world. And they suck. You know, I mean, there's so much bad coverage that it makes it hard to have a conversation about this. I mean, you're a professor. You're not intimate with the IT staff or the library. And you want to talk about technology. Who's there? Maybe right. You're seven years old. Maybe your colleague, who's in the same boat you are, and your professional organization, which isn't going to touch this, what do you do? Well, CNN is part of this action, the Chronicle. I mean, that's, that's a serious, serious problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's the only reason that we might we work so hard on every campus trying to you know, improve the conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, students self-report that the first place they go for help with anything, either if it's making a movie, if it's understanding blogs, or how to use Facebook, the first person they go to is a peer. And so that's mm -hmm. another thing that we're really sort of Interested? In how do how do we make that make that connection happen? Let me find this. Uh, there was a study about Flickr, which was taking a look at how people search for Flickr. I had to find the story. I, I, I don't want to I don't want to paraphrase it inaccurately. The, the it was the same pattern. If you were looking for images, people tend to search their network first yeah. before they search the whole Flickrverse. Um, the interest in this network went through a similar process too. People would search for friends of them. Mm -hmm. that, that, that pinging is very important. So is that that trusted source? You know, or, or do we superimpose this this thing that we create face to face on top of our social networks as well? Um, I don't think it's superimposed. I, I think I think it's an it's an analog that we carry <laughs> over. And and uh, I mean, Janet Murray makes this argument that whenever you have a, a new medium, you have this first stage where you take uh, old practices and paste them into new ones. And we've been doing that for a while. So that's our Second Life conversation from this morning, where yes. what we're doing with Second Life right now is we're essentially just rebuilding so that, this yeah, room. So Harvard, Yale, Law Prof, who built yeah. a copy of the lecture hall. Right. 
Great, you've got a bad pedagogical space and you spent money and time reproducing it. Excellent, have some media coverage. Yeah, great. I, I just had a conversation with one of our folks about this and mm -hmm. in regard to Second Life and he said it, it reflects largely, you know, trying to get to grips with the new medium mm -hmm. and the, the same way that in the early days of film, they set up a film camera and had a theatrical production and yep. they just filmed it and then they realized, hey, what if we change the angle? What if we move splice things together, move the camera? What if we, do, you know. Do you know Lev Benovich's uh, book on new media, language on new media? No. It's a great book, you should find it, especially if you like movies. It's mm -hmm. okay. a big focus in silent film. Films. It's no, neat. If you look at film from the 20s, you get a real sense of how new media works. He's looking mm -hmm. at Vertov and, uh, well, especially Vertov, but when you see people like breaking the laws of film, you're like, wow, what happens if I have split screen? Whoa, <laughs> this is interesting, you know? In many ways, yeah. you look at Mist, you look at, you know, MySpace, and it's right. like that. We're like, oh, mm -hmm. we can do this. But then we have that second stage. You know, when we mm -hmm. we're going to take a little camera and move the camera or splice in stuff, right? Then yeah. that's, that's what we're 2.0 is in many yeah. ways. That's where, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, we have to get to that stage of, of thinking in those terms, what we can intrinsically do with this. And, and one of the things that frustrates me about Second Life is that it hasn't happened. But one of the reasons is because Linden Labs doesn't want you to think about history. And we've been doing Second Life stuff for 20 years. Yeah, there right. are projects just like this. Adobe's Atmosphere, yeah. Active Worlds, I've given international class in Active Worlds, Muds and Moose. No. I mean, the Cathy Sierra case. Nobody talks about Julian Dibble's rape in cyberspace. Right. One of the most widely taught essays about cyberspace ever. 1993, mm -hmm. yeah. they covered these same issues. I mean, we have to have that historical sense. Uh, if we're going to talk about this, so you know, talk virtual, virtual spaces. Okay, how about V Roma? They built Rome in the, in the age of Nero. Right. Um, 1990, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yes. They've been updating it every couple of years. You know, as the mm -hmm. technologies change. So let's look at that. What did they learn? No, no, no. to say it's brand new. No, you can't do that. I mean, for your profession, instructional mm -hmm. technology, academic computing, it's kind of history. I mean, have you seen the Blackwell's book? Yeah. The Digital mm -hmm. Computing and Humanities. Mm -hmm. This computing for the 40s being yeah. talked about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we got to honor that. Yeah. And it's hard. And, that's yeah. hard. and it's hard for us. It's, it's hard for people in our space to yeah. take a step back and, and, and look back. Which we're, we're spending all this time yeah. looking out on the horizon and trying to well, turn and our heads looking and look right back. here, making sure that this, this is yeah, on. This is the red light you know, on. You know, <laughs> enough mics. Yeah. You know, uh, we were just talking about the, the, the Twitter feed breaking. You know. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard and it's, it, it's unreliable and it, it is what it is. And there's no yeah. percentage in bringing back history. You know, it's really hard to get that state. Yeah. You know, Faulkner had this great line. He said, the history isn't dead. Hell, it is human past yet. You know? <laughs> I think that's a, that's an important point. 